I just want to highlight some thoughts here, and then we're going to end up back in, in Romans 5 as we end the service tonight. But it says, we have been led, as we believe, by the Holy Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Aren't you glad that the Spirit of God draws us to trust Jesus Christ our Savior? He convicts us of sin. He convinces us of our need of righteousness through Jesus Christ. And, and when we respond in faith to that, we're born again. Aren't you glad about that? And biblically, only born-again believers are supposed to be scripturally baptized. That's the only way to be baptized is scripturally. And it's always after salvation. It's always by immersion in a biblical church. And, uh, and that's what it talks about. Saved and baptized and joined together as a congregation into this covenant with one another as a body of Christ. Somerville Baptist Church is a body of Christ at Somerville. And you help make it up. And uh, we're thankful for that. It says, We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to give this church a sacred preeminence over all human institutions and organizations. That means this church needs to be important to you. And what's important to you, you are committed to. You're involved in. You know, a lot of times people, they're involved in different organizations. But, you know, the organization you need to be most committed to is your church. I mean, you, you can be on the PTA, and you can help out with the school, and you can help out with whatever, uh, but you know, uh, you need to, this needs to be the priority, because that's what God's Word says. This, is, this ought to be a priority. And, um, and it says we ought to strive for its advancements in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, and promotion of its prosperity and spirituality. As a member of Somerville Baptist Church, you affect the spiritual climate of this church. And that's why it's important that we have the right attitude. It grieves my heart when somebody, all they do is gripe and complain about whatever. Gripe and complain about the country, gripe and complain about this, gripe and complain about that. We influence the spirit of this church. If we bring a negative spirit into worship, guess what? That affects other people. We ought to bring a, a spirit of, of gratitude and graciousness and glory to God when we come to worship. Amen? Now, everybody has a bad day every once in a while, right? If you have a bad day, come to church. Maybe it'll help make it a better day. Amen? Oh, yeah. Some preaching, some singing, some praising might rub off on you and make you have a better day. Amen? But we've got to realize that we, you know, if you don't like the spirit of the church, help make it better. Amen? If you think it needs to be more spiritual, be more spiritual. You are the church. We are the church. We influence its spirituality by our spirituality. We influence its knowledge of God by our knowledge of God. We influence its graciousness by our graciousness. We, inst we influence its holiness by our holiness. And just like anything else, the strength of a church is only as strong as its weakest member or link, however you want to put it. Everyone in this church, every member of this church affects this church, positively or negatively. And we need to take that seriously. And so it's our responsibility to advance God's work in this place because we are God's tools in this place. And notice what else it says. We agree to sustain its worship. You know, it doesn't matter if Pastor Frank's here or if Pastor Frank is preaching or if somebody else is preaching. If you're home and it's worship time, you ought to be worshiping at your church because it's the Lord's church, amen? It's not Pastor Frank's church. It's the Lord's church. And, uh, and we ought to, we ought to uh, it says we ought to support, we sustain its worship and its ordinances and its discipline. In our Constitution, there's a section in there about church discipline. And we've had to do it, unfortunately. We don't, we don't go on witch hunts looking for problems, but when problems are presented to us, we deal with them. 
We're not going to ignore them just because of, you know, who it is or what it is or whatever. We've had to deal with some, pretty, some things that are pretty painful. But we can't stick our head in the sand and act like it's not there, right? Church at Corinth did that, and that's what the whole first book of Corinthians is about. It's a pretty scathing letter, amen? We don't want to be like that. And we don't make up stuff, and we don't go looking for dirt, but when there's problems that are obvious, we got to deal with them. And that's part of our covenant. And that's, why, that's another reason why we have people read our Constitution. We had somebody read the Constitution. They didn't like that part. They didn't like the part about church discipline. They had never been in a church that, you know, did that or talked about that or made any issue about that. They didn't want to join. That's, that's fine. They kept coming for a while. They quit coming after a while. And lo and behold, down the road, there was some really serious problems there. You know, I'm kind of thinking that point about church discipline spared us from having to do some church discipline. Amen. So, you know, we, we do, you know, there's a good reason why we have people read the Constitution. And then it's doctrine. You know, doctrine's important. Right? You know why doctrine divides? Because doctrine defines what you believe. There's, like I said, there's a lot of churches don't even have a constitution. You know why? They don't want to define what they believe. Because they want whoever to believe whatever and to come there and do whatever. And as long as, you know, as long as they're, they're hanging around and they're paying a little bit and you know, helping out a little bit, everybody's happy. That's not exactly what I see in the New Testament as a biblical church. You got to believe right. You got to believe the Bible. So that's important. The doctrine of the church is important. We agree to contribute cheerfully and regularly and support its ministries and its expenses, the relief of the poor and the spread of the gospel throughout the, all nations. Yeah, as a member of the biblical church, you make up the church and therefore you vote on decisions of the church and you help make those decisions happen. We vote on a budget. Guess who funds the budget? The members fund the budget. We vote on missionaries. Guess who funds the missionaries? The members fund the missionaries. So it's our obligation to fund the ministry of God that we, make, we help make up. Guess what else is our obligation? Who does the ministry in a biblical church? The members of the church. I was talking about this to one of my boys. I don't remember which one. But there are, there are churches that pay everybody for whatever. And people don't even have to be members of the church. They pay people to sing. They pay people to play. You know, they don't have to be members. It's a job. We kind of think ministry ought to be ministry. <laughs> and it ought to be done because you love the Lord and he's gifted you and he's called you to serve. That's kind of the way it's supposed to be, right? And membership's an important part of that. So the funding of the ministry, the work of the ministry. And it says the relief of the poor. You know, this, this, is, this building and this property is, belongs to Somerville Baptist Church. There are churches, the pastor owns everything. It is literally his church. That's not biblical. And I mean, if the, if the church closes up, he takes the checking account and he heads out. That's not biblical. It's not my money. It's not my building. It's not my property. And guess what? It's not my responsibility to make it all work. It's not mine. It's ours. Correct? Correct? So that's why when we have a work day, it's a church family work day. Amen. Not a church leadership work day. It's a church family work day. Because we're all part of the family, right? So if there's a trash on the ground out there, anybody is elected to pick it up. Amen? There you go. If there's water on the countertop, you don't need to wait for the janitor to clean it up on Monday or Thursday. Anybody here...
can get a paper towel and clean up the water on the countertop. I've just commissioned you to that job. But the bottom line is you don't need commissioning. You're a member. If you see something that needs to be taken care of and it's an easy solution, it's not going to cost anything, fix it. Now, don't go tearing up walls and stuff like that. We do need to, you know, consult some people about that. There's, a deci- there's something I would like to do next door, but I'm not going to do it until I talk to the trustees about it because it involves a bit of money. That's how we work around here. We work together. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? But this is, this is what our covenant says. Then it says... The relief of the poor. We, in, our con, in our budget, we have a deacon's fund. That's where we help people. We have a pastoral uh, help fund. That's where I can help people in ministry. Those are benevolent funds. And then the spread of the gospel. That's our missions. That's us taking tracks in our community. Guess what? Every member of Somerville Baptist Church ought to be giving to the work of Somerville Baptist Church, the ministry, And ought to be giving to the missions of Somerville Baptist Church. And every member of Somerville Baptist Church ought to be helping to spread the gospel in the Grand Grand Ron Valley by spreading the gospel personally. That's part of our covenant. That's part of our commitment to one another and to the Lord as a church. That's our responsibility. And the sad, the f- sad fact is, everybody's not doing that. And we need to pray that everybody does do that. Yes. I, I long for the day that 100% of the members give tithes. And 100% of the members give to missions. And 100% of the members are involved in ministry. Guess what? We're not there yet. Brian, are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. Brian's the bookkeeper. He knows what, about the money. I don't. I just know what he tells me. He keeps me pretty ignorant, and that's good. Because I've told him, I don't want to know people's names. I don't know what, I want to know what is given. I just want to know totals. That's all I want to know. He does a good job. But would you please pray with me that we get to 100%? Because, you know, it amazes me how much is being done with about 60 to 70 percent giving tithes and about 40 percent giving to missions and about 50 percent doing ministry. I'm amazed at how many, how much is getting done with that. If we had a hundred percent, just blow my mind how much could get done. Amen? If we had 100%, would you please pray with me we get to 100%? Before I die, I'd like to see 100%. So, you know, if you want, to, you want me to kill over quick, get to 100%, I'll probably have a heart attack. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. And then it talks about support or helping your pastor. When, when I was presented this church, this church was asked to pray about voting for me as a, as, a, as a pastor. I assume that it did it, and I assume that you voted led by the Spirit of God. And, and as pastor, you need to let me lead, and you need to let me preach, and you need to let me correct things that need to be corrected. Now, that's one of the reasons why we have deacons for checks and balances, so I don't go rogue on anybody. Amen? And the deacons don't go rogue on anybody. And we, we often have to say, hey, just settle down a little bit. Amen? Not often, but every once in a while. I remember one time we were dealing with a situation, and I was getting a little cranked up, and John Martin said, Pastor, you need to settle down. So he was right. He's not always right, but he was right then. (laughs) The next paragraph says, we engage to maintain private and family devotions. That's part of our commitment. That's going to help us grow spiritually. Talks about bringing our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and 
seeking the salvation of those that we care about, those around us. Talks about our life in the world, walking circumspectly, honoring God, being different from the world. Talks about personal holiness. Gives some scripture about that. Talks about avoiding gossip and tattling and backbiting and excessive anger and lustful entertainment and alcohol and, illicit, and uh, uh, the illicit drugs. Those are things that we're committed to together for God's glory in this place. It continues and it talks about not being a stumbling block. Romans 14 talks about things that uh, people feel at liberty to do, but those, that liberty should not be a stumbling block to others. Proverbs 20 verse 1 says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It says deceived thereby, not intoxicated thereby. Big difference. You can be deceived a long time before you're intoxicated. It says deceived. It doesn't say addicted to. You can be deceived by it a long time before you're addicted to it. And you know what? If you don't let yourself get deceived by it, you'll never get addicted to it. And you never get intoxicated by it. And, and logically, you don't, you don't have to agree with my logic, but you really can't argue with my logic. The best way not to be addicted to it and not to be under the control of it is to just not use it. It's the best way. It's not the only way, but it is the best way. And there's a lot of scripture there. You can look it up. At the end of that paragraph, it says, We agree to uphold high standards of Christian morality as outlined in the scriptures of the King James Version and to be zealous in our service for the Lord. You know, different people have criticized different things about our church. That's okay. You've got to have thick skin, amen? You know, if our music was a little bit more contemporary, more people would come. There's a whole lot of churches doing that. I don't think we need to do what everybody else is doing. Right. And, you know, if we didn't make such a big deal out of, you know, alcohol and tobacco and things like that and separation from the world, more people would come. There's plenty of other churches doing that. I kind of don't think we need to do that either. We don't need to lower the standards. We need to keep the standards. Amen. Don't need to compromise. We need to just stick to the word. Another thing people have said, if you didn't make a big deal out of King James Bible, more people would come. I'm kind of thinking the Bible's pretty important. Amen. Yeah. I think it's a big deal. Now, different people in this room think one or more of those things are more important than other things. Guess what? I think they're all important. I think they're all important. And it goes on and it says, we determined to walk together in Christian charity, loving one another. If you haven't noticed, the last couple of weeks have been about God's love and our experience of God's love and our display of God's love. And the calls to worship and the messages, it's kind of been the theme. It's right here in our covenant. You know why it's in our covenant? Because it's in the Bible. We need to not only experience God's love, but we need to love God back. And we need to extend God's love to others in grace. And we need to share God's love with people that have not experienced it by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. That is the whole totality of the Christian life. To be loved by God and to love God and to love one another. It's all over the Bible. That's what God wants us to do. And everything important to God and important in this book fits into those, those things right there. Being loved by God, loving God, loving others. And sharing God's love with others. That's basically the summation of this book. Jesus said that. What's the great commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And the second is likened to it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Didn't Jesus say that? So this is our covenant. I thought it was just a good idea to refresh our memory about what we 
have committed to together. I wish more would be here to have heard it and looked at it, but it was in the bulletin, and they did hopefully take it home, and maybe they might read it, and that would be a good thing. Amen? If you leave here, you ought to find a church like it. Because the Bible does speak about church membership, right? I'd encourage you to look those verses up. I, I quoted one of them and referred to what's in the other ones. Uh, but I would encourage you to look those up. I want you to go back to Romans chapter 5 in the last few moments of our time here. And I want you to go to that last verse that we looked at this morning and we ended up with. And I want to share with you a little bit more detail about why the word atonement is there instead of reconciliation. If you were to compare with other modern translations, most all of them would have the word reconciliation in there. Why does the King James Bible have the word atonement in there? Here's one good reason, okay? The word atonement is basically, a, an, it's an Old Testament term. And, um, and the word that's translated atonement in the Old Testament, more often than not, in a couple of different places, it's mostly found in Leviticus and Numbers, the word atonement. It's other places, but that's the bulk of where, it, of where it's found. And in its, in there's a few different places where that word is translated, a, not atonement, but reconciliation. Even in the Old Testament, the same word that's used for atonement in most places is translated reconciliation, even in the Old Testament. Just like here, the word in verse 10, for, that is translated in verse 10 where it says, reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Those two Greek words are the same root word that's translated in verse 11, atonement. So why did they do that here? In fact, it's the only place, this, this word that's translated here, reconcil reconciled and reconciled and atonement, is only found four times in the New Testament. Twice it's translated reconciliation, once reconciling, and then wants atonement. And it means to exchange. It means to restore, make restitution. And there's a statement here I want to read to you. Uh, it says, adjustment of a difference reconciliation, restoration to favor in the New Testament of restoration of favor in God to sinners that repent and put their trust in the expiatory death of Jesus Christ. And that's what one of the words for atonement is. It's defined as to expiate. The idea to expiate means to remove. To, like you have a stain in clothing you put some, something on there to remove it. You expiate it. It's gone. Now, the word atonement I mentioned before is used 70 times in the Old Testament. I didn't give you that amount. The most of them are in Leviticus and Numbers. And there are two Hebrew words that are translated atonement. And basic, they're, they're, uh, one of them is used probably 85 to 90 percent of the time. The other one's used just a few times. And the, and the literal meaning means to cover or a covering and to expiate, to remove. And the idea of expiate means to, to show that you are sorry for something bad or to put an end to something that is wrong, to extinguish the guilt incurred by doing something wrong. That's what expiate means. 
And the idea of atonement in the Old Testament means a couple of different things. It means to cover up. And the, and the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they were a temporary covering of our sin, and they pointed to Jesus Christ, which would be the final covering and cleansing of our sin, the removal of our sin, the expiating of our sin, the ending of the guilt of our sin through forgiveness of, sin, of our sin. Jesus Christ does that. The blood of animals could not do that. In fact, the Bible says that in Hebrews and in another place in Romans. It says the blood of bulls and goats could not do that. Only the blood of Jesus Christ could do that. And so why did they say atonement here instead of reconciliation? This one time. And I mentioned this morning the difference between verse 10 and verse 11 is that last phrase, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now received. And I mentioned that the word reconciliation means to bring together opposing parts. And I also mentioned the definition of atonement is at one meant. Bringing together separate parts. And that's exactly what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross does. It makes us at one with God. From being opposed to God to being at one with God. To being separated from God to being in harmony with God. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He not only reconciled us, but he made us at one with God. By cleansing and removing our sin. Not just covering it, but cleansing it and removing, expiating it. Putting an end to the guilt between us and God in his death on the cross. That's what Jesus did for us. Now I mentioned this morning that the book of Romans was written to believers in Rome. Some of which were Jewish, some of which were Gentile. I mentioned that. For every one of those Gentiles, the word reconciliation made perfectly good sense. It was fine. That was a good enough for them. But for every one of those Jews, this word atonement really fits and helps them. Now received the atonement. My friend, for all those years in the Old Testament... All of those sacrifices, they were pointing to the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. Now we have complete atonement in Jesus Christ. Finally, it's done. It's finished. Isn't that what Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. You know... In, in, in a dictionary, if you were to look up the word atonement, this is Oxford's dictionary, and it says, the Christian theology, the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. That's what the word atonement, that's the definition that's given for atonement. The origin of the word atonement comes from the denoting of unity or reconciliation, especially between God and man. And this is, this is where I use that term this morning. From at one meant between God and man. Unity. It speaks of unity. And that's exactly what church membership ought to be. Unity. Yeah. Unity in Jesus Christ. Unity in baptism. Unity in communion. Unity in belief. It's all about unity. And it all starts with unity in Jesus Christ. In the Webster's 1828 dictionary, the word atonement is uh, de uh, defined as agreement, concord, reconciliation after enmity or controversy. And in fact, it gives Romans 5.11 as an entry to look at for the definition. Atonement.
And in this passage, the King James translators were trying to give the full definition of this Greek word, not only in the word reconciliation, but also in this word atonement, because it gives the complete understanding of being at one with the Lord, which is what Jesus did, which is what all the Old Testament laws and sacrifices pointed to for Jews and Gentiles alike. And aren't you thankful for that? Yes. I sure am. At, we have now received the atonement. In the reconciliation we have in Jesus Christ, we now finally have atonement hey. forever. Well, that's a great thing, isn't it? That's a blessing. The action points this morning, the first one I wanted you to think about in the, in the outline on this morning, you just turn it over and look at the bottom there. What is the proof of my love for God and others? Aren't you glad God proved his love to us? That's the idea. He commended it. He displayed it. He made evidence of it. The love we have ought to be displayed in evidence. How are we showing it piece by piece, moment by moment? How are we demonstrating our love for God so other people see it? How are we demonstrating our love for others so they can be blessed by it? What is the visual display of our love? We need to think about that. Because if we really love, there ought to be some visibility to it. It's an action. It's not just a feeling. The second action point is what is the provision of my love for God and others? Are we truly loving God and others with the love that he's extended to us? Are we experiencing that provision for him and then extending it to others? See, it all starts with him loving us and, and us experiencing that love so we can love others and love him properly. What is the provision of my love is it his love for me? Or am I trying to do something in my own efforts? What, what are we using to provide love from us to God, from us to others? What difference is it making in the world? And then what is the product of my love for God and others? See, real love produces something. Aren't you glad God's real love produced something? It produced something. It was demonstrated, it was shown, it was displayed, it wasn't hidden, it wasn't kept private. It did something. And if we're really experiencing that love, we ought to do something with it. There ought to be a result. What's the result of our love for God in our life? What's the result of our love for God in the lives of other people? How is God's love to me impacting others through me? What's the result? What's the, what's the product? What's the result of our love for others in their lives? How is me loving someone else impacting them? And what is being done because of our love for God and our love for others? What's being accomplished? I don't know about you, but when I look at God's love for me, I see a whole lot accomplished. There's been impact in my life from God. Well, when I receive that love, if I use that love to, it, and extend it to somebody else, there ought to be some impact there. That ought to make a difference. So I want to challenge you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as a recipient of the love of God in your life, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a member of Somerville Baptist Church, let's go out those doors and out into this community this week and let's make a difference. Amen. Let's take the provision of his love and use it to produce an impact in the lives of other people for his glory, not for ours, but for his glory. Let's bring him the glory he deserves. Let's pray.